Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Why don't you stand up and join us? If you're joining online, welcome to Tree of Life in Pflugerville, Texas. Let's just begin to invite Father in. Just extend your hands. Just begin to give thanks. Begin to honor and acknowledge his presence. He's already here. He's there with you in your homes, wherever you're watching this. Father, we just thank you. We bless you. We give you all the glory. Lord, we come with grateful hearts this morning. We welcome you in this place, Lord, and we give you all the room to move. Have your way this morning, God. You alone are worthy of all our praise. Lord, we just come this morning and we bless your name. Holy Spirit, take my hand now. Lead me out in the living water. You're the wellspring. You're the stirring. You're the life for your sons and daughters. Eyes are open to the unseen. And my faith is arising in me. So bless the Lord now. Sing it out loud. Come and give the Lord his glory. Calling me deeper, deeper still. Calling me deeper, deeper still. I'm going deeper, deeper still. Into your love, because your love keeps going deeper, deeper still. Calling me deeper, deeper still. I'm going deeper, deeper still. Into your love, into your love. Eyes are open. To the unseen, and my faith is arising in me. So bless the Lord now, sing it out loud. Let your hands give the Lord His glory. Calling me deeper, deeper still. Calling me deeper, deeper still. I'm going deeper, deeper still. Into your love, because your love keeps going deeper, deeper still. Calling me deeper, deeper still. I'm going deeper, deeper still. Into your love, into your love. There is freedom in the water. There is healing in the water. Oh, Jesus, you're the river. We'll never find the end. There is freedom in the water. There is healing. In the water, oh Jesus, you're the river, we'll never find the end. There's freedom, there's freedom. You're calling me, you're calling me deeper, deeper still, calling me deeper, deeper still. I'm going deeper, deeper still into your love because your love keeps going deeper, deeper still. Calling me deeper, deeper still. I'm going deeper, deeper still into your love, into your love. There is freedom in the water. There is healing in the water. Oh, Jesus.
There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. There is a light. There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. Father, we're on our knees with every heartbeat we give you this offering. Lord, come and fill this place. Father, we're crying out. Spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. There is a king. There is a king who reigns in victory. There is a mercy strong enough to save. We feel it rising up from the ashes. There is a love that overcame the grave. There is a love. Father, we're on our knees with every heartbeat we give you this offering. Lord, come and fill this place. Father, we're crying out. Spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. Lord, come and fill this place. And I will worship you. I worship you. I worship you always. And I will worship you. 
singing the Lord said be real be real and so before we start this next song I just want to give you a, some reality about kind of what's going on so this morning as a praise team <laughs> we were talking as we came in um, we're all dealing with something in the air our voices aren't what we want them to be we're tired you know, we're just real, right? I was late. I came running in 15 minutes late for practice. And just real, right? We're real people doing real life. We're all dealing with, you know, the COVID and the, you know, what's going on in our society, what's going on in our lives and our marriages, our relationships, our kids, our finances, our jobs. Let's just be real. That in that, there are challenges. And we're all challenged somewhere. We're all sometimes carrying a load that's heavy and sometimes we have people to hold our arms up sometimes we don't sometimes it's just us and the Lord and we're just in it and we get tired and we start to get weary right and this next song talks about we're walking around these same walls waiting for them to fall and the Lord is telling us look he knows where we are he sees us and just as real as our circumstances are he's a real God and he is truly on our side. And he is working on our behalf even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. But he's there. So this song may not be sung perfectly by me or any of us, but that doesn't stop him from being a perfect God. change to come and knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet your promise still stands great is your faithfulness Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know the night won't last, your word will come to pass. 
keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never church this next song talks about the sun shaping the shadows so you might be in a dark place and you might not think that in that dark place that God has any control but the sun is shaping the shadows so your walk and your hard times and the things you're going through he is right there he is letting you go through that to make you stronger, to help you bring himself, bring yourself closer to him. So don't forget, don't forget that the sun is shaping the shadows around you. beginning can control 
what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the middle is the place where you promise to be. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you be?
Yes, Lord, we thank you so much for being in this place. With those that are here and even those that are at home, Lord God, we thank you that you are always with us, that we do not have to walk alone, Lord God. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for this service. And I just pray for every person that's present, every person that's watching, that you fill them with peace, Lord Jesus, that you help us walk out this week well, Lord Jesus. And may you help us remember that, God, that we are not alone, that you have never forsaken us and you never will forsake us, God. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you for the peace that you bring to our life, Lord. You are lovely and you are wonderful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning. Welcome to Tree of Life Church. My name is Kristen. I'm the children's pastor here. Um, I'm filling in for Pastor Cheryl and Pastor Mike. They are in Kansas, taking a well-deserved break with some family friends up there. Um, we're so excited you are here at service today, and those that are online, welcome. We're glad you're here with us. If this is your very first time joining us, um, there are some bulletins, and inside the bulletin, there is a Let's Get Connected card. If you can fill that out for us and put it in the offering bucket. Those will be at the door uh, at the end of service. The ushers will have those offering buckets, and that's where you can place those cards. Um, I hope y'all are all having a great week. Um, I wanted to share a scripture real quickly, and it's one of my favorite scriptures, and it's something that God's been speaking me to this, uh, speaking to me this week. I don't know how many of you are struggling with this, but I know for me there's, there's kind of been um, a need in my life for some peace. You know, there's been some rumblings, there's been some talk. Um, you maybe have people around you that right now you just know that they're walking through some really big uh, fears and struggles in their life. I know many families were approaching school again, and that might bring up some, <laughs> some hesitancy, some fear, some, oh my goodness, I mean, it's already July, and it feels like all the other holidays are just right around the corner. And so I just wanted to share this scripture real quick before we go into announcements. And it is in John 14, 27, and it says this. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. So in the next coming weeks, I just want to encourage you, if you're like me and you're facing some things that seem a little bit overwhelming, um, pull up that scripture and declare it over yourself. I'm a big believer that we need to declare the word of God over our lives. And sometimes we need to maybe uh, press mute on some other things in our life, right? Um, make sure that we are maybe not always listening to um, other reports that are negative, you know? So I just encourage you, that was John 14, 27. If you're needing some peace in your life, speak that over yourself. Amen? Amen. All right, so I am so excited I get to do the announcements today because a big chunk of them are about VBS. Woo, woo. Um, we have a fantastic outreach coming up. It is VBS. It's starting next Monday, okay? And what VBS, what VBS is, is it's Vacation Bible School, and it's an outreach to the kids of our community. So that's number one. If you know any children between the ages of 3 and 12, neighborhood kids, family kids, um, friends, please invite them. This is a free outreach, and it is fantastic. Um, I love it because every day we share the gospel with these kids. Every day they hear about how much Jesus loves them, um, and they get poured into. And then we've got kids I know who love Jesus, and what's great about Vacation Bible School is it also teaches them about missions and outreach, and one of our outreaches that we're going to focus on is actually we are blessing the kids in our community with school supplies this year. So it's the first time we've done it, and I'm really excited about it, and I'm hoping we can build on it. So that is another way that you can help. Out in the lobby, we are collecting school supplies. You'll notice in your bulletin there's an insert, and it had a list of things that we're collecting. So if you want to purchase any of those items, even if you're just at HEB and you pick up a couple glue sticks, that's fantastic. You can bring those back um, next Sunday or any time during the VBS meeting, we're accepting those gifts. We're going to be challenging the kids to bring something as well during VBS. But really the main challenge is 
that we have a heart of a giver. We have a heart of somebody who has their eyes open to the needs around them, not just focused on ourselves, and um, that we pl- implant that in their lives to actually be looking around to see what is your community need? What are the needs of the people around you? So I'm like, super excited about that. If you have any questions about that outreach, let me know. And another way that you can help with VBS is we're going to start decorating next week. We have some amazing decorations. So we'll be here on Saturday, July 31st. It's the end of July already, which is crazy. Um, But we'll be here at 9 o'clock. I want to make sure I'm telling you that it's my decorating day. 9.30. We'll be here 9.30 on Saturday um, to help help decorate. And when I say decorate, it's easy stuff. It's like painting, stapling, putting stuff on the walls. And then I'll also be here on Sunday at 4 p.m. to decorate again. So you guys will get to see some of those decorations on Sunday morning. And I'm super excited about that. So that's some ways that you can help. If you're interested in volunteering at VBS, it's not too late. Just let me know. We have two sessions. There's the evening session for the kiddos that are in elementary school. And then we have three days on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's for the preschoolers. Um, Also, youth, make sure you guys mark your calendars. You guys are having a back-to-school bash on August 21st, and there's more information to come on that, but it'll be during the service. And we're encouraging you guys to invite some friends. Invite some friends to the back-to-school bash. Get them in church, and you guys will have a blast at that. And then last but not least, um, if you are interested in handing out those backpacks, we are going to be doing that on the 7th. Like I said, this is the first time that we've done this, so I'm really excited about seeing how it goes. We're going to set up a drive through where folks can come through. We're going to just bless them, hand them a backpack, and send them on their way, give them some info about the church and such. So that will be Saturday, August the 7th. We're going to pack them at 9, pass them out at 10, all right? So um, join us for those things. Again, this is a great opportunity even for you to show the love of Christ to folks in our community. Um, And I'm just excited about the upcoming season and the upcoming outreaches that we're going to be having. All right, so this morning I'm going to introduce Jack. Um, Jack is one of our elders here at the church. And let me tell you, Jack is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. He's going to hate that I'm doing this, but he is. I've been on many missions trips with him. And let me tell you, Jack is just such a faithful, wonderful person. He has helped so many people here at the church one-on-one. You, you don't even know. It's like so, so many people that he's met with, that he's prayed with, that he's counseled. And what I love about him is he's just so faithful, that he's just always there. He's someone we can always depend on. And um, I just so appreciate everything that he's done here for the church. And so today he's going to be sharing some words with you during the message. And I would love if we could just give him a big hand clap to show him how much we appreciate him. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Let me have that, too. All right. Blessings. God is good. Um, At the end of the service, we're going to have an opportunity to give, and so we'll have baskets at the back. We used to pass them around, but, you know, things have changed the last year and that sort of stuff. So if you're online listening, I want to encourage you that you can just go to our website if it's something that is on your heart but I want to tell a little story about about giving Um, one day my wife and I when we were young in our marriage probably married about six or eight months and we had been invited over somebody's house to play 42 42 is a domino game if you don't know wonderful domino game created by a couple teenagers because their parents taught them you can't play with cards because they're demonic so they created 42 but anyway setting that aside we're on the way to that house. My wife says, you got to stop at a store. I said, why do we have to stop at a store? He said, we've been invited to somebody's house. I said, okay. Well, we have to bring a present. You don't come empty-handed. And I said, what do you mean? They, don't, they didn't require a present. She said, no, no, no. When you're invited to somebody's house, you never come empty-handed. You always bring a gift. I said, how do you know these things? She says, my mama taught me. It's proper etiquette. So my encouragement to you is, and you out there in internet land as well, you've been invited into the kingdom of God. Whenever you come into God's house, it is proper etiquette to bring a gift, just so you'll know. Proper etiquette, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That is in one of my books I've written, just so you'll know. Um, I've got a lot on my heart this morning. I want to, uh, that song that we sang about peace and also... Uh, Kristen shared about peace. Uh, Forty years ago, I gave my life to Christ Jesus, and I was pretty much a tormented soul, quite frankly. 
Uh, I was ho- hanging on by a thread, and I invited the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart, and he showed up in my bedroom and revealed himself to me. And what he did to me was he put peace into my life, which I did not have peace before. I've walked with God for 40 years. There's one time I went through a three-year span where I was in deep, deep depression. But even in that deep, deep depression, I always knew tomorrow would be better because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I still had this hope and this peace that was in me, and it's never left me. And I'm telling you that peace of God is a wonderful thing. And if you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and, and you don't have peace in your life, the Lord wants you to know that Jesus came, he died for your sins to give you eternal life so you could be restored with God the Father. That's what this is all about. You're an eternal being and God wants you to go to heaven and be with him, to live forever with him. We were created to know him, to love him, to spend time with him. That's where, why we were created. We are literally created in the image of God, male and female, we were created in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, nothing can stop you from walking with God if you so desire. That's the only requirement. If you want to walk with God, nothing can stop you because Jesus has paid the price for everything you need for life and godliness so you could have a walk with him. And if you accept him, he says he will never leave you, never forsake you. Even those times when you think he's not there, a couple weeks later, when you come through that hard time, you realize he was there the whole time. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Thank the Lord. Today, you guys that uh, have not been through discipleship class, which is something I do every year, it's a 27-week discipleship class, very intense. We're going to do week 15, so you'll get a taste of it, so you'll see kind of what discipleship class is like. It's going to be a little bit different because I'm up here in a pulpit, and this is not quite the intimate setting that we have in a classroom with uh, four to 12 people. But by the same token, I wanted to give you a taste of what discipleship is about. Discipleship is about laying a foundation of God's kingdom in your life correctly. Um, so when the wi- winds and the waves and the, uh, the trials of life and all these things that come against you, uh, they hit you hard. They don't knock you over because you know who you are in Christ Jesus and you know what he's done for you, and you know how faithful he is to you and all those things. Uh, but one of the things that I want to speak to you about today, the Lord put in my heart while I was down there, was this. Um, when we went through World War II and we bombed uh, the Japanese, we were the victors. Immediately, the Japanese took on our persona. I don't know if you know that or not. We could have gone in there with the gospel, but we didn't. We went in there with capitalism, and they became like us. They took on our demeanor because we were the victors, and they said, these people must have it right, so we're going to do what they do. And they became very good at it. And, of course, in the 1970s, all the Japanese cars started coming over here, and now they've made better cars than we have uh, and things of that nature. Our cars are starting to catch up. But the point is they took on the persona of the victors. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it doesn't end there. We are literally called to be ambassadors, is what the Bible says. You have become an ambassador of Christ the minute you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whether you want to or not. I didn't know that. A lot of those things I didn't know, I learned by walking with him over time and getting into his word. Had I known some of these things... I might have considered my decision a little bit deeper. I didn't know I was going to have to give up this, 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 this. And you don't have to give up any of it if you don't want to. But the fact is, the Holy Spirit continues to deal with your heart. Y'all have heard the story, Pastor Mike has taught on it many times, when Jesus went into the temple and he started throwing things around. Well, the Holy Spirit now lives within you and you are that temple. And everything that is unclean in there, he starts cleaning out. Why? Because he is the perfect father. And he wants you to represent his kingdom in such a delightful way. He doesn't want you to be adorned with all sorts of sins in your life and all sorts of uh, uncleanliness and all these things. He wants you to show you to the, sh- to the world as a shining star of what the Lord Jesus Christ can do 
because he has created you for an, a reason under heaven, and that's to show forth his glory. So we're going to, um, this is actually week 15 in the discipleship book. It's called, Why Must We Know the Word of God? So that's just one segment. Why must we know the word of God? My first scripture that I'm going to share is 1 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ as through God we are making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled with God. As though God were making his appeal through us. So that's what's supposed to be coming out of your mouth. God is making his appeal through you to the rest of humanity, to be reconciled to God. That's who we are. That's who an ambassador. I, I, I want to tell you a little story about George H. Bush. That was the daddy. He fine man. He served our country in many, many different capacities, probably more than most of you guys know. But he was actually pro-abortion for many, many years. Well, he ran into Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan said, Hey! I want you to be my vice president. Well, he had to change his views. He no longer had the right to expound his beliefs because now he's the vice president of the United States and the president says, no, life is precious. We can't be aborting babies because that's killing human beings. And so he eventually took on that persona, the same persona, and actually he eventually changed his heart and that became part of it. You are no different. An ambassador... When you're sent to a foreign country, I don't have the right, literally, I don't have the right to go, well, we're going to do things this way, this way, and this way when the President of the United States says, this is the way we're going to do things. I don't have the right to expound my own beliefs, my own thoughts, my own dogma that I get from my friends, my neighbors, the newspapers, the press, uh, the movies. I don't have that right. I've given that right up. Why? Because I am now an ambassador of the kingdom of God. So what am I supposed to expound? What God says. What God says, what God believes, the way he wants me to conduct my life and act on the face of this earth. <clears throat> so some of those things would be 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, that being Jesus, who knew no sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So there's a righteousness available no matter who you are if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not a religious righteousness. You can't do enough good works to go to heaven. That righteousness comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What is that telling us? That's telling us, you don't need to clean yourself up and come to God. You come to God the way you are, and I will clean you up. A lot of people think, well, I need to quit this and this and this, and then I am going to start going to church. I need to do this and quit this, and then I can walk with God. No, that's not it. He's your daddy. If you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you become his child, and then it's his job through the Holy Spirit to start changing your life incrementally. When I first came to the Lord, I had a stiff neck that you couldn't believe. I was very, very rebellious. Well, God just faithfully moved that out of me over the years. I used to would not preach, literally, unless I was in cutoffs and a white t-shirt and flip-flops. Why? I never saw in the Bible you had to be in a suit and tie. So, my dad burn it, I'm not going to get in a suit and tie. I didn't believe you had to be a licensed minister. The Bible says we're all ministers, Right? So I wasn't about to get ordained. But God eventually moved all that hardness and that rebellion out of my life. He did come to me one day and said, I want you to get ordained. Like, what? Why would I want to get ordained? He said, it's not for me. It's not for you. It's for the people that you're going to talk to. I was fixing to start going to many, many churches because I was in charge of a particular event in East Texas. And they weren't going to accept me unless I was an ordained minister. That was the reason. But he worked it out of me. Had he tried to do that originally when I first started walking with him, it wasn't going to happen. But God who is faithful will continue to change you because he is so, so faithful. 1 Peter 
this is a scripture that I just love. I've been preaching on it for years. But you were a chosen people. That's all of us. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Raise your hand. You are a chosen people. That's good news. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession to proclaim, get this, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's part of your calling as an ambassador, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He didn't say to let you sit there and wallow in your sin. I apologize. I didn't know that was going on. Thank you. Um, He called you out of that. He called you out of that. Now, the, the reason this is so important is because there's seducing spirits out there. The Lord talked to me about seducing spirits about two weeks ago. And seducing spirits... You understand the word seducing. They don't just come and blindside you because then you would instantly see them and you go, no, I ain't going to have any part of that. Real. But a seducing spirit slowly, methodically spends its time and starts creeping into your life and you accept it because it's just incremental and starts coming in. And before you know it, you're way off base. But you defeat that by the word of God. I'll give you an example. So a lot of you know that God has called me to pray at all the capitals in the United States of America, which I've been doing. It's not an easy job, quite frankly. Uh, but he's confirmed to me over and over again that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some of the things I've come across. I was in Ohio, and uh, there was a big riot. Is riot the right word? No, there's a big assembly there, and they're protesting something that the government's doing. There's about 100 people there, and I'm there with my Jesus flag, and I stand back and I observe these things to see if the Spirit gives me anything I need to know. And so I'm standing there for about an hour before I start my prayer walk, and um, they've got every ungodly sign you can imagine at this meeting. And it's grown to now 300 people, and it's in uh, in front of the Capitol, and they're protesting something that's going on. And then the man of God gets up. And I've seen this numerous times before at other capitals, but this time a man of God gets up. This first time I've seen this, he gets up and he prays the most wonderful prayer. And I went, all right, all right, there's, there's hope here. And so I left and I started my prayer rounds and doing my binding, my loosening, and praying for the peoples of Ohio and those things. It's a pretty hot day. About my fourth time around the capital, I stop in, in a shady spot in a chair and I rest. And then the Lord speaks to me. And this is what he says. He says, they pray in my name to promote their own agendas, but their heart is far from me. I went, oh my gosh. And so now I know that this is a more directional prayer that I need to start praying. And so this group of people, they have about seven speakers lined up to speak at this thing to to promote their agenda. And then about my sixth or seventh time around the Capitol, I get back to the front again, and the same preacher man is up. He's, He's the closing speaker. The same preacher man is up. And I was shocked at the things that were coming out of his mouth. Every ungodly, vile thing you can imagine. Hate speech to the nth degree. And lies, just lies after lies after lies was coming out of this man's mouth. And he's a man of God, and most of his congregation is there. And they're all going, yes, yes, yes. They're all for what he's doing. And it's very, very divisive. But I'm telling you, that man of God did not get there all night, uh, overnight. He had seducing spirits that creeped in his life and started changing things incrementally. And he bid on them, and they started changing his message. And the Bible teaches us that in the last days, many people's faith will grow cold. And, and the Bible teaches us in the book of Galatians that let him be accursed if they preach any other gospel than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we know these things are going to happen. 
So I'm here to tell you we have to guard our hearts and we have to stay true to the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the teaching today that I'm going to be bringing is about the Word of God. Why must we know the Word of God? And if you balance your life out with the Word of God, you're going to stay safe. So <clears throat> we're going to move on. Um, so as you minister the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to remember one of the things that can really keep you on track is John 1.14. And it says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. So you can take this preacher man for a minute. And if he was speaking the truth of the gospel with the grace of the gospel, everything would be fine. But he wasn't preaching grace or truth. But my point is, if you preach the truth of the gospel and you not walking in grace as you're preaching it, all it does is condemn people and drive them away from the kingdom of God. That's all it does. I've seen it done numerous times. I've seen that kind of hate speech out there. And it's a religious spirit that just separates people from, the, from God. And if you preach the gospel, the grace of God, without the truth of God, the way Pastor Mike puts it, is it's sloppy agape. And that has no place in God's kingdom either because he's our father. He's continuing to change us from glory to glory. So I'm going to start off with uh, this parable. There was a king that had a large kingdom, and he had defended his land, uh, and he left a young son behind, but he left the young prince with words of wisdom, and he told his son, I must leave for a season. My kingdom has been overrun by bandits. I will soon be departing. However, I will not leave you helpless. I will leave you a set of instructions, encourage you, and give you strength. If you learn and apply these instructions, they will become powerful in your life because they will literally train your hands for war to do battle with the bandits. Soon it is your choice, excuse me, son, it is your choice to obey my instructions or not. If you choose not to obey my instructions, the bandits will have total control over your life while I'm away. They will torment you, they will rule over you, they will inflict pain on you, and generally make your life miserable. You will still be my son and the prince, but it is not my desire that the bandits control your life. I have given you everything you need to overcome the bandits while I'm away. It is my desire that you learn all of my instructions and apply them. If you choose to obey my instructions, you will remember that you are a powerful prince in this kingdom. And everywhere your foot lands will be yours because you will be temporarily in control of my kingdom. If you know my instructions and apply them, the bandits will shudder with fear when you walk in. The choice is yours, my son. What will it be? Will you allow the bandits to rule over you while you're away? Or, you will, <clears throat> or will you believe and apply my instructions and strike fear in the bandits while I'm away? I'll be coming back soon and I will store all things. It is my preference that you, my son, my prince, will be walking in victory when I return. So one of the things we do in discipleship class, and we're going to do it real quick. I'm going to pull this scripture up. Uh, Maybe you all got it. John 16, verse 13 and 14. Can you pull that up for me, please? Excellent. So this is, this is one of the things we do in discipleship class. We do this because uh, we live by the word of God, but Jesus said we need the Holy Spirit to bring us revelation. However, when he comes, the spirit of truth, he has come. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will not speak. On, he will speak his own authority, but will tell will, what he hears. He will speak and he will tell it to you things to come. Go ahead. Fourteen. He will glorify me. He will take from what is mine and declare to you. So this entire Bible that we're looking at belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and God, the father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said is going to be our teacher. That is what we pray. We invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher because it's very, very dangerous when you try to use the Scripture to prove you are right. Because the Holy Spirit, because then you'll harden your heart and you'll close your heart off when the Holy Spirit will be your teacher. It doesn't mean you don't listen to preacher men. You do. You listen to preacher men, but then the Holy Spirit comes behind and testifies to the truth. 
So we're going to invite the Holy Spirit. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you that you love us, that you receive us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have died for our sins. And we thank you that you have sent the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And we know that you'll take from what belongs to you and make it known to us. And we know that that brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to look at <clears throat> Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. So we know as believers that we have a transforming effect that is supposed to be taking place in our life. Um, and quite frankly, some people would call it brainwashing. That's what it really is. We are washing our mind with the word of God so that we can become more God-like. That's what he wants us to be. When somebody is rude to us, he wants us to respond with the grace of God. He doesn't want us to jump and go, you're a son of a gun, I'm going to hit you in the face because of what you did. I will never forgive you. No, that's not the way he wants us to respond. He wants us to respond the way the Lord Jesus Christ did. And that can only happen if we have our new man washed with the word of God. Because we're not supposed to react, we're supposed to respond. So you might say, well, how do you do that? That's a good question, and it is by the word of God. So our topic of discussion is, why must we know the word? Okay? And so... When I read these scriptures, that's what you want to ask yourself. Why must I know the word? And that scripture will give you an inclination of why you personally need to know the word of God. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is Acts 2.42. Hallelujah. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, this was uh, right after the church was birthed, and this is what they started doing. This is very, very important because this is four points that you need to know to keep you stable in God's kingdom. And it's kind of like a chair has four legs, and that makes it stable. If it has three legs, it's going to tip over a lot easier. This is true in the kingdom of God. Here's the four points that will make you very strong and stable in the kingdom of God. Um, the the Apostles' Doctrine, now let me say something to you, we're just in the book of Acts. So the Apostles were receiving revelation along the way from God that is now the New Testament. And so that's the Apostles' Doctrine that he's speaking of. There's a lot of things Jesus did not address that the Apostles did address in the rest of the New Testament. So we need to adhere to the Apostles' Doctrine. To fellowship, we need to be fellowshipping one with another. Why? Because... Quite frankly, if you get out on an island by yourself and you get so spiritual, you think, well, I don't need to go to church or I don't need to fellowship with the brethren. It's me and Jesus. You're going to start hearing deceiving spirits and they're going to deceive you because you'll start receiving revelation that's deeper than everybody else. I don't need them. No, the truth is you need your brothers and sisters in Christ because if I come to you and say, hey, I just got this revelation and it's not of the Lord. I can say, brother, that's a little screwy. Show me that in the scriptures. Because remember, the Holy Spirit will be our teacher, and he only takes what belongs to God and Jesus and brings it known to you. So if you're receiving revelation that is apart from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not revelation. It's deceiving spirits, and they've come to shipwreck your life. And they can sound very nice. But fellowship, you need to have somebody that you can bounce things off of uh, to make sure you're hearing good things. And then the third thing was break, um, breaking of bread. Um, now, that can be interpreted a lot of different ways. I like to interpret it, the Lord Jesus was broken for you. And you need to really wash yourself in that. We're going to cover that in John chapter 6 in just a few minutes. But the breaking of bread is, is, is basically the Old Testament, and, and Jesus died for you, and he was broken for your sins and your trespasses, and his blood was shed for you. And then lastly, prayers. So you want to have a good, strong prayer life. People make that very complicated. It's not complicated. It's just you're talking to the Lord Jesus. 
just like I'm talking to you guys now. Uh, hallelujah. 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Excuse me, John 1.1. 1, 1. Thank you. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what is the Word of God? Amen. Amen. So why do we need to know the Word? Because it is God. <laughs> Hallelujah. John 1.14. Now, I've already stated this scripture a minute ago, but here we go. John 1.14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word became flesh. The spoken Word of God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and died for our sins, was resurrected and given new life. And us, by accepting Him, we become a child of the living God. But He came with grace and truth. And so you need to balance everything that you say out of your mouth. Literally, those are prayers that I pray every morning. May I speak with grace and truth. I don't want to say a curse word to my wife because she did something I thought was foolish. I don't want to do the same thing to my son if I thought he did something plumb stupid. I want to walk in God's grace and his truth so people can see the kingdom of God in me. Because Jesus, uh, well, there's a statement made that says, if, if he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. You know how he's lifted up in our lives? I mean, that was talking about being lifted up at the cross, but quite frankly, it's also us. He's lifted up in our lives when we walk in grace and truth, when we choose his will over our will. You don't understand. I have the right to be angry, and I have the right not to forgive that person. You are correct. You have that right. But Jesus laid down his rights so that all humanity can be saved. Now, you want to know how powerful the gospel is? When you choose to lay down your rights and take on the same banner that Jesus did, you literally give people entrance into the kingdom of God. But if you choose to retain their sins and hold it against them, you just close the door in their face and you hindered them from coming into the kingdom of God. That is powerful. So the choice is yours. Are you going to be an ambassador? Are you going to take on the nature of Jesus? Are you going to speak the things of God with grace and truth? Because if you do, you're opening the doors for other people to come into his kingdom. In the name of Jesus. Um, here's John 6, 48 <clears throat> through 56. Uh, I am the bread of life. This is Jesus speaking. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And this bread, which I will give you for, for the life of the world, is my flesh. At this, the Jews began to argue among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, um, I stated that breaking of bread was the Lord Jesus Christ, being in him. Because that's what this is talking about in John 6, 48 through 56. So why must we know the word of God? Because it's the bread of life. I, I remember uh, Peter said something once that, that really touched my heart. Um, and, and actually, it was in John chapter 6, a little bit later in the chapter, uh, when he made these kind of statements, it said later that many people turned away and walked from him with him no more because that was such a strong statement that he made. It was very offensive to all the people that were kind of on the fence or on the outside a little bit. 
But then Peter said, Jesus said to Peter, are you not going to leave or something like that? And Peter said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Even though this might be a hard statement, it's hard for me to understand. I've tasted, I've seen that you're good and you have the words of eternal life. You're the one that can change my heart. You're the one that can take this hate out of me. You're the one that gives me direction. You're my hope. You're my salvation. And he literally said later, you are the Messiah. Hallelujah. Matthew 4.4, 4, anybody that knows me very well knows this is one of my foundation scriptures that God gave me when I first started my walk with God. And it says, man, th- and, and just the, the, the prelude on this, this is when Jesus was, uh, after he'd been baptized, he went out in the desert and he was tempted by the enemy for, for 40 days and 40 nights, no food, no drink, things of that nature. And then Satan came along and, and started trying to uh, literally use the word of God against him. And this was his response to one of those things. So Jesus said back to Satan, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So why should we know the word? Because Jesus literally said, we must live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if you think about that for a second, wait a minute, this is the Messiah. This is the one that saved me. This is the one that forgave my sins. This is the one that gave me eternal life. This is the one that put the peace of God in my heart. Why in the world would I not read that scripture and go, oh my gosh, I've got to put away everything. I've got to change everything I do. All my thoughts, everything in my life now is subject to that. Just like President Bush, excuse me, he was Vice President Bush at the time, said, okay, I won't promote abortion anymore. I will believe that that those are unborn babies are true human beings. And I'll adhere to that because you're the one that made me your vice president, and I am now an ambassador to what you say. And we are an ambassador, an ambassador of the kingdom of God. What an honor. Are you hearing me? What an honor has been stowed on you. I don't know who you guys are. I mean, I'm a, I'm a high school dropout. That's who I am. I'm a guy that beat up my teacher. That's who I am. I'm a guy that used to be a thief. That's who I am. And that man stepped in my life and forgave me and put the word of God in me and changed me. I don't know what he did for you, but why would I not believe everything he has to say? Why would I not want to take on his persona? Why would I not cast off everything that rises up in my life and says, no, you can't believe that? I have to because he saved me. He forgave me. He healed me. He touched my mind and put peace in it. Now I have three children that all gave their life to Christ because I had two of them before I came to Christ. I have a granddaughter that I baptized in Ecuador and all these things. Why? Because I stood up and chose to believe God and everything that comes out of my mouth, I circumcise it to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it's not circumcised, this is a prayer I pray every morning. Lord Jesus, discipline me when I mess up. That is literally one of my prayers every morning. Discipline me when I go against your will. Because I want nothing but pure gospel coming out of me. I want the light to shine out of me. I want people to go, that man walks with God, listen to what he has to say. Not that they would follow me, but they would follow me as I follow Christ. And you have that same ability for people to look at you and go, wow, that's a man, that's a woman of God. I'm going to listen to what they have to say because they've got the words of eternal life flowing through them. And that life gives light and hope to the world. Because see, if you walk the face of this earth and you say, well, I'm a Christian, and you're absolutely no different from the people you're trying to minister to, why would they want to give their life to Christ? Because I guarantee you, they're miserable. They may look joyful and happy and all those things on the outside. They may look like they're having a good time. But see, there's this scripture that says that we were created to think about eternity. We have no choice 
God, our creator, created us that way. So when we get home at night and we face the reality of the day and our brain starts trying to shut down, we start thinking about this stuff. Is there a God? Does he love me? Is there eternal life? Yes, there is. But if you don't walk the face of the earth as a changed life, why would they want to be like you? Because you're no different than them. He's looking to change your life because it shows forth the glory of God. Amen. Um, Psalms 119.9. Once again, our theme is, why must we know the word of God? This is one that hit me real hard when I was a young man. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? I love that. I want to be pleasing to my daddy. And so that's how you stay pure. Hallelujah. Psalms 119.105. This is a good one. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That means that I don't have to stumble around in darkness. The word of God literally is a lamp to my feet and a light of where I'm going. One of the things most of us want to know is, well, what is my calling? Where am I headed? Things of that nature. Just walk with God because he's a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. He will guide you. He will instruct you on the ways you need to go in this life. He will tell you about your future. A lot of the things you're not going to know for many, many years I'll give you an example. When Jesus walked in my bedroom that night, started talking to me. Some of you know this. He picked me up like a little baby. I couldn't see him, but I could feel him and just rocked me like that and spoke all these comforting words to me. And he said, people will call out to you because you know the way of salvation. And he also told me, you will go around the world. Well, that was 1981, 82, right through there. Well, I didn't go around the world until 1995. No, excuse me, 2005 is when I started going around the world. But the Bible says that he, in, in, in those scriptures that we read in the beginning, um, John 16 says, he will tell you things that are yet to come. So every one of us, he's told us things about our life that have not come to fruition yet. But you need to hold it out there and understand that he spoke those things in your life and they're real. And so 1982, 2005, let me see, 18 plus 5 is 23. 23 years later, what he spoke to me was fulfilled. But along the way, I've always had people calling out to me because they knew that I was different than them. They knew, even if I wasn't preaching, they knew that I was different. They knew that I had a peace. They knew that I walked with God. And so they would call out to me and say, what is different about you? What do you know that I don't know? And that's the power that you have that has been invested to you because the Lord Jesus Christ, or actually this is the Apostles' Doctrine. Apostles' Doctrine says you're an ambassador of the Most High God. What a calling. Wait, little old me? There's a no account of nothing? I am an ambassador of the kingdom of God? I actually want to get a card made, and, and I did it once, but... That was when I was younger in the Lord. Just says, ambassador of the kingdom of God. Then when I go through the airport lines, I'm an ambassador. See if I can get through that faster line. <laughs> I hadn't tried that yet, but I've considered it. <laughs> Hallelujah. But well, what an honor. Psalms 119.89. Your word, O Lord, is everlasting and firmly fixed in the heavens. Why should we know his word? Because it is everlasting. It is life. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer it smashes a rock. I love that scripture because the word of God sometimes will come into your life and just it'll just burn things right out of it. When things that are unclean, things that you don't understand correctly, he'll just come in and just burn up. In addition, the word of God will get down in your belly and burn, and you'll have to speak it. But sometimes when I prophesy, not all the time when I prophesy, but sometimes when I prophesy, and for whatever reason I'm feeling a little bit of insecurity about it, because you prophesy by faith, but sometimes that thing will rise up in my belly like a fire, and I go, I can't keep quiet. i got to say something. And that's what the word of God is like. It's like a fire. 
And it's also like a rock, like a hammer that crushes things in your life. You can have a stronghold in your life that has been there for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and the Word of God will come, the anointing of God will come, and it'll just take that thing and it'll just smash it. And poof, it's finished. And you're free, free to walk with God, free to be fr delivered from alcoholism, free to be delivered from sexual immorality. Just bam, and you didn't think it was possible because you've struggled with it. You've cried to God for months and years and all those things and it hadn't happened and then bam overnight the word of God comes like a hammer and just crushes that thing and now you have victory in the name of Jesus Christ myself I was an alcoholic and I didn't think I was going to get free of that but I had already given my life to Jesus and I came home one day uh, let me put it this way if I didn't have alcohol in my belly by 9 a.m. I was cramping you know what that's called? An alcoholic. <laughs> Very functional because I drove for a living and I was out of my job and all that kind of stuff and drank the whole time I was on my job. Had my whiskey cabinet for when winter came and things of that nature. And on the weekends, you know, I drank a lot more. But I was a very functioning alcoholic, but I was an alcoholic. And I came home from church one day and opened my refrigerator. And there's all my beer, all my Lone Star beer. I'm a Texas boy, Lone Star beer. And I went, oh my gosh, I hadn't had a beer in a week. And I said, Beverly, God's delivered me <laughs> of alcohol. So I went and got all my Lone Star beer and I poured it down the sink, opened up my whiskey cabinet. I bought whiskey by the gallon. But I went to my whiskey cabinet, pulled out my gallon of whiskey and I poured it down the cabinet. And I didn't touch alcohol for many, many, many years. Now I can actually drink socially now if I want to, but I don't anymore. I, I kind of stopped all that. But that's what the word of God can do. He can, just, he can just come and deliver you in an instant. Doesn't matter what you are. He's not a respecter of persons. These are all true things in the kingdom of God because he's God. He's the one that sets us free. Jesus was on the face of the earth and he was healing people right and left. He was casting out demons. And he's given us that same authority, if you don't know it, as an ambassador of the kingdom of God. You have that same kind of authority to lay hands on the sick and they will recover in the name of Jesus. You have the authority to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Don't use those authorities lightly, but be led of the Holy Spirit. Because if you do them lightly, you, you kind of get careless. If you get careless, you're going to get stomped on a little bit. And that's okay because if you love God, he'll correct you and he'll use it as a learning training experience for you and you'll become better at what you do. But let me tell you, you have great authority as an ambassador of the kingdom of God. Great authority. All right, we're going to James 122 through 25. This is one I, I it's kind of like slapping somebody across the face. Are you paying attention? That's the way I take James. I, I, I love the book of James because James, to me, is, is, is the New Testament Proverbs. He, he doesn't pull any punches. He just lays it out there. I love the Proverbs. I read the Proverbs every day. There's 31 Proverbs, so I read a proverb every day of my life, a chapter. That means I've read the Proverbs many times. I've been walking with God for 40 years. But they're just so practical. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. James is of that same vein. They called him James... Uh, the Righteous One, is that what he was called? James the Righteous One, I believe is what he was called. Uh, James one twenty two through 25. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Otherwise, you're deceiving yourselves. Do we want to deceive ourselves? No, we don't want to deceive ourselves. For anyone who hears the word but does not carry it out is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after observing himself goes away, immediately forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and continues to do so, not being a forgetful hearer, but an effective doer, he will be blessed in what he does. It reminds me when, when, when I was a kid, one of the things that drove my generation, and this is the Jesus freak generation, if you want to know my generation, what drove us to the kingdom of God is, is there was plenty of Christian religion out there. But we were hippies, 
and we were rebelling against society and we weren't received by the mainline church and we didn't want to have anything to do with our self-righteous religion, quite frankly, because it was all palm and pomp and they didn't. And see, I always believed that there was a God. I always believed that. And I always believed if there was a God that he must love us. I always believed that also. I don't know why I believed that, but I did. Even when I didn't know who God was, I believed there was a creator. And he wasn't in, the, and though he was in those churches, please forgive me, I'm not trying to be too critical. It appeared to be religion. And we didn't want anything to do with religion. We wanted a relationship. And that's what the Jesus Freak movement was all about. We found out there was a relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got news for you, and this is my doctrine, and I still preach it today. The Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Did you know that? Who were the only people Jesus ever criticized? Pharisees and Sadducees, which was the church of the day. They were the ones that were supposed to walk with God. That was the only people he criticized. But he came to show you you could have a relationship with the living God. It's not based upon your righteousness. It's not based upon how good you do. It's not based upon the way you dress and the way you act. It's based upon he became your daddy. Just like I might have a son that might be wayward, I'm his daddy. And once you become a child of God, you have gained entrance into his kingdom. And he's the perfect father and he will continue to deal with your heart. And he will continue to get all that junk out of your life because he's a faithful father. He's a faithful father. It has nothing to do with religion. Jesus came to destroy religion. That is my doctrine. And if you have a problem with that, you can talk to me after the service. But he came to replace it with a relationship with the living God. Whether you're Baptist, Pentecostal, I don't care. Do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus? That is what it's all about. Hallelujah. Um, thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, Deuteronomy eleven eighteen. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them to your reminders on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. He's just letting us know here how important his word is because his word gives us life. And then I want to go to Hebrews 4.12. Remember, our topic is, why should you know the Word of God? Because it brings you life. Hebrews 4.12, this is a very, very good one. I teach it a little bit different than some people. For the Word of God is alive and active. That's what it's going to be in your life. It's alive and active. Sharper than a double-edged sword, it penetrates to the dividing of soul, spirit, joints, marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. Uh, Everybody loves this scripture, but quite frankly, remember it is a double-edged sword. And that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees weren't getting. They were using one side of the sword, but the other side was slicing them right in half because there was the Son of God, the Word of God, right in front of them, and they didn't see Him. So if you start coming across as a judgmental, religious-type person, this precious Word of God is a double-edged sword. It will hinder you it will cut you it judges the thoughts and attitudes of your heart only God can do that only God can do uh, look at your thoughts of your heart Jesus was reading people's thoughts all the time it, it, it would literally say he knew their thoughts and so he addressed their thoughts and that's what the word of God does to you and this is this perfect father he's not being mean to you He's letting you know, hey, okay, so a good example would be the prodigal son. The prodigal son went out and sold himself, you know, and ended up in a pigsty. This is Luke chapter 15, I believe it is. Uh, and he realizes, oh, I should go back to my father. Even as a servant, I'm going to get, you know, plenty of food to eat, so I'm going to go there. And then there's the other son who got really upset because he had faithfully, in his mind, served, served his father all this time, but his heart was unclean. His heart was far from God. 
And so it was judging the thoughts and attitudes of his heart. And the same thing will be true for you. God has jumped my case when I've been judgmental. Look, we're human. We're fallible. We're going to make mistakes. Understand it. You need to understand we're going to screw up. That's why we need Jesus in the first place. We're going to mess up. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to prophesy perfect. You're not going to minister perfect. You're going to make mistakes. Your heart is going to uh, be self-motivated at times. But just remember that you're in relationship with this wonderful Father. And the Holy Spirit will come and He'll slice your heart open. And you go, Son... That's not the way I want you to conduct your life. So don't harden your heart to Him because the Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God because the Holy Spirit of God will come to you and He will open you up and He will look at your heart. He will ask you to do things and then you have to decide, am I going to obey? I want you to go apologize to that person over there. I really didn't do anything to hurt their feelings. I want you to go apologize. No, I'm not going to. Well, you just harden your heart to the Holy Spirit. And then your heart, if you continue down that vein, your heart gets harder and harder. And then the Holy Spirit just backs off and lets you do your own thing for a while. And then you'll come to your senses one day, like the prodigal son, going, wow, where's this sweet fellowship we used to have? It seems to be gone because you hardened your heart somewhere. But he's faithful even when we're faithless. Because he's the perfect daddy. He's going to come to us. He's going to correct us. And he will get our attention again. Thank God. It's not a license to mess up. But thank God that he's not going to stop working with me. All you guys that know me very well know that I love uh, that scripture in Philippians. I think it's 3.12. And it says that he, meaning Jesus or God, will work into you the to-do his good, the will and to do his good pleasure. What? Well, I don't want, think of the, think of the story of Jonah real quick. And I got to close up, but think of the story of Jonah real quick. Jonah didn't want to go preach to the Ninevites. No, 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 I don't want to go. But God got his attention and he went. And then he was all pissed off when it was done. I knew you were going to be gracious to him and that makes me mad. I don't like those people over there. Dang it. You did exactly the way your nature is. And that makes me mad. But he still loved Jonah. I mean, if I was God, come on, dude, <laughs> get with the program. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. You can be really screwed up, but if you're his child, he's going to remain faithful to you. He's going to keep working with you. So you screwed up, so you hardened your heart. It's not a license to do that, but just remember, he's going to crack that hard heart with that hammer of his. And he's going to start making your heart tender because you want to serve him and you want to show forth his glory. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> all right. And Jeremiah 15, 16. I got to go quick. When your words came, I ate them, and they were joy in my heart and delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Colossians 3, 16. Now, here's where we need to dwell. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And then, once again, this is the Apostles' Doctrine, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God breathed and is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training, and training, and training, in righteousness. So we're righteous because of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there's this training in righteousness. And then I want to go to Timothy 2, 3, and 4 because I want to dissect this scripture just a little bit. First Timothy uh, 2, 3, 4. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved. This is a twofold scripture. He wants everyone to be saved. That's God's will on the face of the earth. He wants all men to be saved. That means women as well. But then he goes on to say, and, so that's a separate entity, and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? That's two different things. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to become his child. 
but then he wants you to grow in his grace and knowledge. He wants you to be the man and woman of God that he's created you to be so you can go forth and show forth his glory on the face of the earth. The choice is yours whether, we, whether you do it or not. That remains with us. It is not enough just to get saved and come into God's kingdom, kingdom and act like we don't have any responsibilities. I know plenty of Christians that do that. Oh, yeah, I got saved 35 years ago. Have fun. See you later. Let me have my booze. No, God has a plan for your life, and that plan is to declare his glory. Please don't forget who you are. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you belong to him, and you were bought at a price. You are now an ambassador of the kingdom of God, and God wants you to take that seriously. You no longer have the right to live any way you want. And everything you do and everything you say should be in alignment with his word and his will. So that's you that haven't been through discipleship. This is kind of one week of the discipleship course, just so you'll have an idea. And this is just on how important the word of God is in your life and why, why we should know his word. So these are just some thoughts on that. Uh, I'm supposed to pray for our nation but as I pray this prayer, um, we want to reflect where we are with God. We want to let his word wash over us and cleanse us. If we have anything unclean in our hearts, we want to deal with that sort of deal. Uh, and so <clears throat> one of the things, and this is a, a, a parting thought, remember that in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus declared to Peter, he said, you got it, Peter, because Peter said, you're the son of the living God, you're the Messiah. That's what Peter said. And of course, he went on to tell Peter, upon this rock, I shall build my church. But about five scriptures later, Peter rose up with his own thoughts and his own attitude that weren't in alignment with the kingdom of God. Because Jesus had said, I must die, I must be crucified, I must be raised on the third day. Peter didn't have an ear to hear. He just saw this man that he loved. And, and so we can love God. We can love God because Peter loved God. So in his righteous indignation, he thought he was doing right, but he was moving in the flesh and not by the will of God. The will of God was that Jesus was to be die, died, crucified, raised on the third day, so all of us could have eternal life. All of us could have our sins forgiven. And when Jesus said that to Peter... Peter said, that will not happen. I'll stop it. I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus turned to the wind, the one that realized who Jesus was. He turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. I want you to hear how powerful that is. You can be a child of God. But if you totally disregard the will of God and the word of God in your life because you think you know better, no, the Bible is out of date. The Bible's got this wrong a little bit. No, we need to do things my way. Jesus might very well turn to you and go, get behind me, Satan. And of course, we know that Peter was eventually restored and he came to his senses and he started serving the Lord according to the scripture. My encouragement to you and I is don't embrace your own thoughts. Don't embrace your own ideas on how the kingdom of God works. Don't espouse your own beliefs on how the word world needs to operate and what's right and what's wrong. This is what he gave us. He wants you to take his will, and he wants his will to become part of your life. That's what you have chosen, though you might not have known you chose to be an ambassador. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you became an ambassador. But he saved you. He washed you. He forgave you. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray now. I'm going to pray the five-minute prayer that we're supposed to pray for our nation. Think on these things. Thank you for letting me share uh, out of week 15 from the discipleship course. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we do pray for our nation. In the name of Jesus. Father, we start with the President of the United States, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Father, we bow the knee to you and we ask, Lord God, 
that you help him, Father, because we know that you can direct his thoughts, Lord God, and help him with good decisions, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for his salvation. I pray the salvation of his family, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for all of our government officials. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for all the legislators, Lord God. Father, these men and these women, they have chosen to serve humanity, Lord God. And I pray, Father, that they would focus on what their original intent was, and that was they wanted to serve humanity. They wanted to serve this nation, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And somehow, Father, when they get up there, their eyes get out of focus, and they start serving themselves. They start fearing about their jobs and things of that nature. And, Father, I pray that they would get refocused. Father, that they are there to serve humanity, Lord God, to make good, righteous laws for our country. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come against every spiritual stronghold that sets itself up in the high places in the name of Jesus. And according to the word of God, Matthew 18, 18, we bind it in Jesus' name. We bind those demonic forces that set themselves up. We cast them down in Jesus' name. And Father, Matthew 18, 18, we loose Matthew 6, 10. Thy will be, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord God, across this great land. We know that you raised this nation up for a reason under heaven. We know that your gifts and callings are without repentance. You raised this nation under heaven to show forth your glory to what a righteous nation could, could be like so that we could send the gospel throughout the earth, Lord God. And Father, we pray for that restoration in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we also loose angelic hosts. Father, across this land, heavenly angelic hosts to do battle in the heavens, Father, for all the peoples across this land, across the United States of America. We loose them in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you, Father, that they are warring angels, or mighty angels, and they're there to do your bidding. They're there to serve those that will inherit salvation. So, Father, we release them in Jesus' name to go and do battle, and we thank you for them in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I also pray, 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4, that you desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that your spirit would move throughout the United States of America. And Father, you would start working on people's hearts because it is written, Lord God, nobody comes unless the spirit draws them. So I ask that your Holy Spirit would draw them, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that our testimony would be true and right on the face of the earth, Lord God, that you would send out men and women preachers throughout the land to declare your gospel, preach the salvation message, Lord God, and many people would be born into your kingdom. I'm reminded, Lord God, Matthew 5, 14 and 15, that we, the saints, are the light of the world, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And a city on a hill cannot be hidden. So, Father, I pray for the same. It goes on to say that nobody lights a lamp and puts a basket on top of it. Father, if we've done that, we repent in the name of Jesus. Father, we want to take that lamp, light it, and put it on a lampstand for the whole world to see, Lord God, so people can see changed lives, that we would go across the land testifying. Because it says, Lord God, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So, Father, I pray that that would be upon our lips and our actions, the way we conduct our lives. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, if we held back, Father, we repent of that in Jesus' name. I'm reminded, Father, of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will forgive their sin. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm reminded about Daniel, Lord God, how he, he bent the knee, though himself, he himself was not a sinful man. He prayed as though it was him, Lord God. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for all the Christians in America, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father, if we have, if we have not... Listen to your word. If we've done our own thing, Lord God, Father, we repent of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you restore 
us to right standing, Lord God. We know according to Jesus that we are in right standing because of him. But we want the Holy Spirit. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We want your spirit to move in us and through us, Lord God, so we can show forth your glory on the face of the earth, Lord God. So we repent for ourselves, for all the peoples of God across this nation, Lord God. And Father, we know, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you don't promote murder. In the name of Jesus, that murder is sin, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And yet many of us, Lord God, vote for people who promote murder, Lord God. So, Father, we repent of that. As a people of God, we repent of that. And we ask that you, that you would change things, that you would have your way, Lord God. And, Father, I pray that would become very real in our lives, Lord God. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, we also pray... For sexual perversion, Lord God, that has taken root in this land, across this great land. And not just here, but in the church as well. And Father, we know, according to the scripture, according to the apostles' doctrine, that we're supposed to flee from those kind of things, Lord God. Not have anything to do with it. And yet we allow it to exist, even in the church, sometimes it is embraced. Father, we're sorry. We don't want these things to be true. Father, we want to turn from those things in the name of Jesus, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. And Father, we even vote for people that promote those kind of things, Lord God. Heaven help us. Change our hearts, change our minds, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father, we want to be obedient children. We want to be salt and light. We want your spirit to move through us. We want to speak grace and truth. Father, we know that you love all these people. But we also know that you called them into a relationship with you out of darkness into your wonderful light, Lord God. And so, Father, let us be a people that are not afraid to speak the truth of the gospel with the grace of God. Father, let us not put our confidence in the, in the government because that's idolatry, Lord God. So we repent of idolatry. We pray for this nation in the name of Jesus. We say, Jesus, you are our hope, not the government. So, Father, whether it be Republican or Democrat, none of that matters. We're Christians. That's who we are. And the government is not our hope. You are our hope. Lord God, in Jesus' name, we bow the knee to you and we honor you, Lord God. And, Father, we pray that we would have a repentive heart for putting the government in the place of God. Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, this last thing that I want to touch on, Lord God, this gender assignment thing, it just, Father, you created man and woman. You created man and woman. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist, though that is the science. That that's how it is, Lord God. These precious, precious little ones are being sent all these confusing messages, Lord God, when they're going through adolescence and all these years when their hormones are going wild and they don't know what the right or left is. They can't make good, solid decisions and they're led by all this trash that we're hearing, Lord God. You created man and woman. And what you create is perfect. And you created them for a reason under heaven, exactly the way they were created. Father, in Jesus' name, we repent as a people of allowing that to operate, even voting for people that, that would promote those kinds of things, Lord God, in Jesus' name. We know that you can reach through the heavens and you can change hearts. And so we ask that you do that. Change hearts. We ask that you get us back on track in the name of Jesus because you have designed this country for a reason under heaven, to promote your gospel. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. <clears throat> Hallelujah. If anybody needs prayer, if we have some prayer people up, can come forward and... Uh, so if you need personal prayer for anything, these beloveds will share with you. Thank you for letting me share your heart. I know this wasn't a regular sermon, but I wanted to give some of you guys the taste of what a discipleship course is like. Uh, 
so you would know. Go in peace. Love the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.